Hi, and welcome to the World Beyond Belief. My name is Paul Marco. And today we have another exciting episode of Techno Crime Fighter Forum. This is episode four. And we have our usual suspects here. We have uh, Karen Melton Stewart. We have Ramola D. We have Dr. Catherine Horton. And Dr. Millicent Black might join us later and get involved in the conversation. This is going to be a particularly exciting episode, and you're going to want to pass it around on your social media, and you may want to download it because we have three important subjects all covered in depth here by our exciting team. Uh, so let me, for the details of what's, what, what's going to unfold, let me turn it over to Ramola D. Hi, Paul. Well, thanks so much for having us again, and welcome. Go ahead. Lost your sound. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, brilliant. I don't know what I did. I thought I clicked the little microphone button, but it didn't really work. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, hi everyone. Thank you, Paul. Thank you again for having us on the show. And yeah, we are excited because today we really want to focus on somebody very important in our midst and whose importance uh, sometimes we tend to overlook. But who's who who's really crucial to this conversation and to the, this whole issue that we are focusing on and that's karen stewart and i was very uh, privileged this week to publish my article finally on karen's um on karen's situation which she recently reported to the director of the nsa admiral mike rogers now as everybody knows karen stewart is a 28 year veteran of the national security agency she was um she was retired a little bit before her time because of various things that happened at her work spot, which she, in a, which she eventually informed the world and the nation about. And she's been interviewed nationally on many radio shows, many talk shows, very much in the alternative media space, though. And the mainstream media world has, in a sense, kind of eluded her story and not really given her the platform that she that her story absolutely needs because the disclosure that Karen offers is tremendous it's absolutely extraordinary um, so in any case one of the things that um, so to go back to Karen's bio actually Karen spent 28 years at the NSA she's an, uh, an intelligence analyst she worked as a linguist and as a translator and um, many things appear to have transpired during her work career which point to um, a form of discrimination in the workplace which led to a series of actions that Karen took to attempt to discover what exactly was behind the fact that she wasn't given work credit for a tremendous project that she had worked on and um, that she wasn't given a promotion that she had been headed toward and just because she made some inquiries internally and just because she approached the office of the inspector general which even on the nsa website is termed as the main office to go to for anybody who works inside the nsa to present any kind of complaint or query anything related to fraud waste or corruption so she followed exactly the protocol that she was supposed to do and she made an inquiry and Shortly after that, it seems like, you know, all hell broke loose in terms of all sorts of uh, consequences were unleashed on her. And the most extraordinary, the most unprecedented kind of consequences, she began to experience all kinds of harassment in the job, hostility in the workplace. And that began to follow her outside the job as well. She began to experience stalking, 24-7 surveillance, and so forth. So the whole story is laid out actually in this letter that she wrote recently in december to the director of the nsa admiral mike rogers telling him the whole story the whole situation because i think much of what transpired took place under the person previous keith alexander general keith alexander 
General Keith Alexander, correct. So she was kind of bringing Admiral Mike Rogers up to speed on the entire situation and scenario and giving him the information that he would need in her case to, to further investigate her case and to understand what had happened. And she looked for a response from the Dernzer, uh, Admiral Mike Rogers, and did not unfortunately get one. And so at the time of going to press, I did call the NSA and tried to get in touch with the Dernzer's office and tried to get an update. And you know, first of all, calling the NSA apparently is a big deal because they don't really have, you know, telephone numbers on the website to say, call us and we're here to chat with you. So there's the only number I could find was the office of the inspector general, interestingly enough, you know, the, the office where people report fraud, waste and corruption. So I called them and I explained what I was looking for. And I um, was put, I, so I said, I want to talk to the dancer. I mean, uh, well, okay, I'd like to speak to the, Dern I'd like to speak to somebody in the dancer's office. You know, I'm not expecting to go to my, my Admiral Mike Rogers immediately, but I'm hoping at least I can talk to his secretary or somebody on the staff. And um, so this guy said, okay, I'll put you through to this number, take it down. And I said, okay, great. And I, and I took it down and I got put through and guess where they put me through? They put me through to the press office, <laughs> you know, the media relations office. And then I explained the whole thing. In fact, I explained the whole scenario, the whole letter. And I said, I'm looking for information on the status of this uh, investigation. You know, what's been the response to this letter at the Dernzer's office? And what is the status of the inquiry or the investigation that the Dernzer is making into this case? So the guy over there listened to me carefully and he said, oh, I know, I know exactly who you need to talk to. Here, take this number down. So I said, okay, and I took the number down and I looked at it and it was the OIG's office again. And so I called them and I couldn't get through. Now they they'd figured out what I was doing probably and I was on voicemail at this point. And uh, then the guy at the media relations also said to me, you can go on the website and put in a media inquiry. And yeah, they've got a page, you know, for media, contact us with a media query. So, okay, I wrote it out. I wrote out exactly what my query was and I sent in a media query. And I got a response back, I think the next day from somebody in media relations saying, hi, Ramola, uh, what exactly are you trying to find out? What is your question? Are you trying to find out if there was a response to the letter? And actually I had spelled out my question very clearly, but I wrote back and I said, um, more than that, I'm trying to find out what the status of the investigation is in response to the letter. What is the response to the letter? You know, what's going on internally? Is there an, is there an exploration going on? Is there an investigation? Well, guess what? Guess what the response to that was? Nothing. That question fell into a void and I have not heard back since from NSA Media Relations. So what could I do? I had to just go ahead and finish my article and, and you know, print it. And that's what I did. And in fact, I'd given them the date of publication and so forth. They didn't, this didn't seem to face them, right? So, so my hands are tied as far as I can tell. They didn't give me an answer and I'm going to have to report that they didn't give me an answer, which seems to suggest to me that perhaps there is no answer. Perhaps there is no investigation. And am I jumping to conclusions here? I don't know, but that's sort of how I read it. You know, they have uh, nothing to report. Go ahead, Catherine. It is, gosh, sorry to interrupt, but I'm just burning to say a couple of things because um, I think, Ramola, what you encountered, and I, I had to laugh straight away because um, I was trying, as you, as you probably know, I was trying to do the same here and talk to Swiss intelligence and I talked to the Swiss military HQ and you know, I was trying to talk to the police. And then eventually I wrote up my experience and especially talking to a senior guy in Swiss um, military intelligence, mm -hmm. I realized that their method when they are asked questions is what I call the bullshit tangle. So you have a direct question and they lead you sideways. It's like, let's go this way. And they say, no, no. And they're like, okay, let's go that way. You know, and it's, it's going in any direction, but the direction they have to go to. So I think um, that's, that's 
and and actually and because because all people who will approach the police all the victims will have exactly the same and it shows you it doesn't matter if you go to swiss intelligence or if you go to the nsa they all have the same protocol which is the bullshit tango and i encourage all victims first of all to go to my website stop 007.org and go to the faq because i've written up my experience of the bullshit tango and how to handle it and I think you have mastered it perfectly. You, they went sent you first to the press office and then back <laughs> and send us an email and then call back, you know, and it's like that. And in the end of at the end of the day, they thought they the, the, the entire name of the game is to fob you off. And you said there is no investigation. And this is the beauty of it. There's no investigation on their side, but they just helped our investigation without noticing. Because if they do the bullshit tangle, instead of doing an investigation, it means that the problem is with them. There is something happening with them. They are one way or another, they are captured. They cannot do the job. So you actually did an in-depth analysis, an in-depth investigation of the director general's office and you found Ramola that he's still captured. That is actually the outcome of all this. He is still captured. And this yeah. is amazing because, I mean, I encourage everybody to go to Ramola's site, which is everydayconcern.net, and read the article. Like, click on it now, bookmark it, and read it after the show because she has all the details. And actually, the evidence that Karen has provided is, is relevant for the entire world. You know? And it's relevant because the NSA handles all our data. And it's funny, it's funny, Ramola, that you're trying to call the NSA and there's no phone number. You know, I would, I would have thought, any, wherever you are in the world, if you want to get through to the NSA, you just pick up any phone and talk into it. <laughs> you, don't even have to turn, you don't even have to dial a number because the microphone is on. I could just dive the ball and start talking, right? <laughs> yeah, just open your microwave and talk into it if you've got a new microwave. <laughs> <laughs> I just open my laptop and start speaking because they've got the entire yeah, house exactly. bugged, they've got the laptop bugged, they've got you're watching me on camera. Exactly. You know, they're so, listening to me inside my car. It's so ironic. Yeah, they're probably reading my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly, they're reading your mind. Just think about what you're gonna say to them. But uh, um Unfortunately it's, it's not too big. You know, it's very <laughs> I really miss well, they're, that the, they're the only federal the comfort of conversation. <laughs> Well, they claim to be the only federal agency that listens. Exactly. <laughs> They've got these T-shirts in the UK about GCHQ, and it says, GCHQ, always listening to our customers. It's, it's pretty much the same. <laughs> by the way, Karen, your screen is, is it rotated by 90 degrees. Did you do that, or did they do that? Oh. Because um, you're sideways. Oh, I see. Oof. It looks like you're going to yeah, separate off. That's it. That's but, it. Uh, properly. By the way, all your all your websites are listed below. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, actually, if you don't mind for a minute, I'd like to just go to my website. I'd like to share the screen and yeah. just show that uh, that article. How do I share the screen? Which one is it? It's the green one. There. Okay. Um, I just want to show you the article. It's right there. This is this yeah th this is it and um, it's added to the description now. Great. So this is the story, and there's actually a couple things I wanted to talk about in the article, if you don't mind. <clears throat> One of them is um, you know as I was doing this article, I started to look around um, media on Karen's case, and actually I was horrified not, to find there was very little. Um, no, we're not seeing yes? it yet. You're not seeing it? No. Do what, oh, what is it? I, okay. What Screen share. Oh, I have to hit share. Sorry. There you go. Whoa, there we are. Okay. It's appearing to be infinitely. Click on. Yeah, it's Click on. not something I'm doing. I don't know what's going on. Oh, my, oh, my word. <laughs> you don't want me to share the screen? Yeah, probably. But seriously, because I was able to do this a little while ago, and now I can't. 
I think so what you want to do is you want to minimize the Google Hangouts because that is the Google Hangouts filming itself on your screen in an endless story. So you just have to minimize the Google Hangout screen where you see us. Um, there are so many of us now. <laughs> so uh, let me see if I can do that. Okay, minimize the screen. Does that help? Okay, let's see. We're getting slow. Hello to specify a window. Specify a window. Application. Application. Application window. I see. Okay, I'll try that. Does this work better? Oh, wow, you it's got there. It. You good. got it. You've got it? Okay, all right, good. Oh my goodness, sorry about that. Great picture. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I'm, I'm the dog. <laughs> well, so here's Karen and here's the dancer. So just for visuals. But, uh, but a couple of things I wanted to highlight in this article really is that um, for one thing, I looked around for coverage of Karen in the media and I was hard put to find mainstream media coverage of her case. And, you know, I wanted to talk about that today a little bit because Karen is a woman whistleblower, as you know, Diana Ring from the NSA was and um, uh, is, and um, Diane Rourke also from the NSA is. And you know, we don't hear very much about women whistleblowers in the media. I wonder why that is. So that's one issue I wanted to point up. And the other thing is I wanted to actually talk about Karen's story because Karen's story highlights something that most NSA whistleblowers apparently have experienced, that retaliation at the NSA starts with psychiatric evaluations. So as soon as somebody reports something to the OIG or makes an inquiry about something, they're immediately sent apparently to NSA security and sent off to get a psychiatric evaluation from an in-house psychologist. And so there's this sort of pattern of naming whistleblowers psychotic or delusional or paranoid. And um, other uh, people have noticed this, obviously, other journalists. And there are a couple articles out there talking about how this has happened to various NSA whistleblowers, including Russell Tice, Diane Ring, Thomas Reinbold, and um, almost so many, so many uh, whistleblowers. And uh, really, Wayne Madsen has written an article where he talks about how this is so much like this is so much like the Soviet system, you know, the KGB system, where there were psychiatric hospitals, where anyone who was considered a dissident who spoke out against the government was immediately sent off to a psychiatric hospital and um, committed as somebody who's paranoid and delusional. And we've come to the point in our country today where that is going on inside our top most security agencies. And those are the kinds of accusations that are being leveled at whistleblowers. And actually people who are targeted, people who are being hit today by EMF weapons and by neuro weapons, when making these reports to local authorities are experiencing the exact same phenomenon, which is very interesting. So it's kind of interesting to see how this, um, this accusation of paranoia is being leveled at people who are reporting the truth. Um, so that's a very interesting aspect, I think, of what is going on. And that is something that Karen highlighted in her article, in her letter to the dancer. Um, and the second, the third thing, of course, is the actual whistleblowing that she did on the phenomenon of stalking and on the phenomenon of um, assault with EMF radiation. So... You know what, Ramola? I, I actually, as you as you were scrolling down, I, uh -huh. I was looking at the evidence that's up there, and I really encourage everybody to read the article, not just once. They should read it. I think you know four times, you know, over a period of a week, because there's so much in there, and I don't think people quite understand how. Well, I think the people targeting Karen understand how important she is, but I don't think the world understands how important Karen is because yes. the, the, the three aspects you mentioned are actually bombshells, absolute bombshells. So number one, 
let's start with the um, you know um, with the actual um, um, the fact that she is the only um, NSA whistleblower who is also talking openly about this microwave or electromagnetic weapon system with which people are assaulted, which comprises the gang stalkers, which are the equivalent of the death squads, you know, the CIA death squads in Latin America. It comprises a satellite system. It comprises electromagnetic, um, you know, um, guns hidden in cars that zoom around town. There is a fully integrated electromagnetic warfare system that's turning on everybody. And none, nobody publicly admitted that apart from Karen. So as one website put it, this is bigger than Snowden. And Karen is bigger than Snowden. That's why, that's why she's silenced. But that, it doesn't even stop there. But that's enough already. She is actually the biggest whistleblower we have which is why they keep her the quietest you know because i think that's absolutely right yeah and, and just to point out there are two things actually about it it's wonderful that you mentioned these um the psychiatric hospitals and the psychiatric evaluations that have been weaponized they have been falsified and they are used as a weapon to silence people and the um drawing the parallels to um communist russia is fantastic because communist russia at the time what many people don't realize was actually under a foreign takeover. That's why it was meant to be taken over by a foreign power that was financed by the bankiers. The entire communist takedown was a takedown of the Tsar and it's the asset stripping of the Tsar and the communist uh, communism that followed was a big exercise in asset stripping. And they could only pull it off by silencing the intellectuals and the whistleblowers. And then, what you have to do as a systems analyst, if you see the same pattern again, you have to think, what if the same process is at work again? What if there's some sort of foreign takeover of the US happening? They have to silence the indigenous American people and their whistleblowers, especially those in the intelligence community, because they would see things first. You know, and how would you do that? You would do it with the same template as they did it in Russia. So that's bombshell number two, right? That's bombshell number two, but it doesn't even stop there because Karen's story, if people read it carefully, has bombshell number three. And this is why Karen's case indicates the biggest threat to national security in the US and the world because it affects the NSA. Because if people read her story and started off that someone else took the credit for her work, her, for her prize winning work, but who took the credit? It was a woman who was sleeping her way up through the ranks of senior level NSA. Now, if it's plural, this is an office romance. This woman did it professionally. That sounds like a honeypot to me. That sounds like a big fat honeypot to me. So when we have psychiatric, weaponized psychiatry, like in communist Russia, which indicated a foreign takeover, combined with a honeypot, getting the senior staff at the NSA, you know, as you always get men, which is by their phallus, then it means that she is, and that's true, isn't it? That's what happened. There, there is some sort of foreign infiltration of NSA. In other words, the NSA is in deep capture. And if people read, if people read Karen's article, she also explains that NSA security was the problem. Everybody's afraid of NSA security because they were a nasty piece of work. Now, that means they were hostile. They were hostile. So if you're looking for why is the NSA in deep capture, by whom, and how they got there, Karen's story has it all. And this is why she's being assaulted with electromagnetic weapons. This is it. I, yes, exactly. I just want to comment on a couple things. You know, when you talked about this woman sleeping her way to the top, I mean, who doesn't know that story, right? We hear it all the time in the, the general world of, of corporate office intrigue. But to hear from the NSA, what's happened is this woman has engaged in deep capture herself because she, it wasn't just one person that was, we're not talking about one affair, one romance, you know, like, um, gosh, what's his name? The general recently, uh, not Ron Petraeus. Scott. 
Petraeus, thank you. Yeah, that guy. Mm -hmm. So how he was let off. I mean, that's actually another story because, you know, he was sharing classified information with this woman, right? And he got off so lightly. Whereas look where Bradley Manning is and look where Snowden is. So, <clears throat> but, um, so this woman is leaving her way to the top. And so she's got upper management in her clutches and upper management has got a stake here. You know, they're all tied up with her. So this whole thing of taking work credit away in this most incredible sabotage attempt, taking it away from Karen after she directed a huge operation, a huge research project, and produced a brilliant report that was acknowledged to be brilliant and acknowledged to be very useful, and then not getting credit for the report because somebody posited that other woman's name as the key author of the report, and then pushed her in for a double promotion, promotion and gave that gift to her and completely sidelining Karen. And as soon as she makes you know, inquiries about it, she's completely suppressed, repressed and oppressed, you know, internally. So, so there's that, the fact that they were trying. And so when Karen actually made this inquiry, the other issue is the scandal was on the verge of breaking, right? Because this stuff was going to come out in terms of why was it given to this woman? What was so special about this woman? What were the connections there? And it sounds like pretty much people inside the NSA kind of knew what was going on. And looking at perhaps people on Karen's workflow would have seen what was going on and would have known, you know, what was going on. So they didn't want to, want to let that story out right? That NSA upper management is so compromisable, so corruptible, and so usable. So <laughs> they kept all that under wraps. It's actually, and you know what, sorry to interrupt, I, you're absolutely no, no, no. right. You put your finger right on the actual issue here, because the fact that they have been corrupted, had this story has already broken. You know, and it has to be remembered that Karen's report, the prize-winning report, saved lives. It saved lives, right? Now, she didn't get the credit for it. Someone else did. And for that to happen in NSA, where other people must have known, it shows that there are actually more people who are part of this deep capture. That's why they needed to get rid of, of Karen. And now they are physically assaulting her, somehow thinking that, you know, the, the, the story about NSA being in deep capture will somehow just disappear if they just harm Karen hard enough. That is nonsense. They just drew, drew actually you know, attention to this fact. But I want everybody who's listening to understand, especially the NSA who's listening, that this is really, really important now because when this happened, and it still happens to Karen, remember last week Karen was literally taken to pieces she was microwaved in her own home. It's brutal. The police started stalking her just the last couple of days. Now, that's outrageous. That's outrageous. But it's even more outrageous because she personally contacted the new director, Admiral Mike Rogers. And Admiral Mike Rogers should understand that now that the deep capture of the NSA is public knowledge, the world only has one question to the NSA. Have they solved it? And if not, when are they going to solve it? And Karen is the cannery in the gold mine. As long as Karen is being microwaved, it means the NSA is in deep capture by a foreign power, by a foreign entity. Now that's bad. That's a national security issue and it's a world security issue because the NSA pulls all our data. So where the hell is it going? If the director general cannot stop the attacks, and okay, okay, we have to admit, Admiral Mike Rogers started his job when in December, or was it November, but fairly recently. So we should maybe, you know, make allowances for the fact that it could be the case he just got into his office, and because it's the NSA, it's really high tech all around him, and he just doesn't even know how to make a phone call because it's so high tech. We have to admit he is, you know, a bit older and maybe he's struggling with technology. But if that's the case, then someone should discreetly go to Admiral Mike Rogers, discreetly explain to him how to make a phone call to his assistant so that he can stop the targeting of Karen Stewart. Because as long as Karen Stewart is being targeted, what this means to the world is that the most powerful spy organization that pulls all our data 
is in deep capture by a foreign power that is not a U.S. entity. That's what it means. Yeah. It's, yes, and there's something else. I'm sorry, I cut into what you were saying. Go ahead, Catherine. No, no, that's it. That's all I wanted to say, actually, you know. Oh, by the way, by the way. Relation to what's going on. Go ahead. In, in a moment, I have to slink off because I, I'm talking to a Polish television as well. So uh, maybe this is a good point because I, you know, I'll, I'll let you talk about this. Um, I just wanted to make this point and I want to, uh, you know, I think we should make it to, to Admiral Mike Rogers himself, right? As an admiral, he should understand international um, relations and it's certainly the international security situation and advertising deep capture of his agency under his office to the world is a really bad idea right now. So I would just say to the NSA who hopefully is listening that they have to get their house into order by yesterday. And that means stopping the targeting of Karen Stewart. Otherwise the entire world is going to be concerned of who exactly is running the NSA. Well, if we can get it stopped for me, we can get it stopped for everyone. There's no excuse. Yeah. I mean, Admiral Mike Rogers he is a Navy Admiral. The Naval Security Group, which is called Silent Warriors because they deal with directed energy weapons, co-located with NSA a few years back. They are at Fort Meade, Maryland, along with NSA. And he can't talk to somebody at Naval Security Group co-located where NSA is? All right, does he not have permission from what kind of boss? Who's running Admiral Rogers? That's it. That's exactly it. Because if he can't stop your targeting, it means someone's running Admiral Rogers and whoever's running Admiral Rogers is running the, elec the electromagnetic warfare system that's global. That's what it means. That's what it means. And, and you, he has to understand that right now, Things are rather tense with China and Russia for obvious reasons. So if somebody else is running NSA, you know, everybody needs to act because someone who we don't even know who that is might be kicking off World War Three through Admiral Rogers of heck knows, you know. So all I just want to say, you know, a message from Europe to everybody who's listening. We're watching carefully because I think if World War III kicked off, it would get rather hot over here, you know? And this is why we are all watching carefully what's happening to Karen Stewart. And if those thugs who are cruising outside her home and typically are within literally 50 meters of her home when they shoot at her and they can't be stopped by the NS freaking A, then something is really amiss in the U.S. intelligence community, and they have to get their house into order by yesterday, basically. Otherwise, we're all going to die, you know? Well, the whole scenario, I mean, really points up the fact that, you know, you're right, our, our intelligence agencies have been invaded on the inside. It's a sort of a Trojan horse scenario, you know? We've got people now inside our government who are acting against the people of America and against the government, against legitimate government, you know. So we've got now the situation of, of deep capture, as you say, that's, that's very internal. And that makes it all the more hard. I mean, it comes back to the whole deep state, right? It comes back to the whole conglomerate, the network of... Um, of criminals, really, who are working from inside. Um, continue, just to continue uh, Catherine's analogy with Soviet Russia, you know what happened to the people in Soviet Russia? I think 60 million of them were slaughtered. Yeah. And they st starved them to death. That's how we yeah. killed them. But this should be a concern to everybody. If you're not targeted, you're targeted. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly, exactly, because what we're seeing now with NSA is the precursor to genocide. That's exactly it. It's a rerun. Someone is using the templates they used in Russia, the template they used in China, because China had the same thing. You know, millions died. And when they're using this again with the most powerful organization that's pulling all our data and knows exactly where we are 24-7, that's, that's an international concern. So Karen Stewart's targeting is an international issue yeah it's like the biggest topic you know, it is 
It is, and actually the kind of disclosure that Karen offers the world is huge, as you said, and this is something I wanted to point up to Catherine, and thank you for pointing it out, is that it's bigger than Snowden. It's not just the NSA tapping our cell phones and our landlines. It's, it's an electromagnetic covert weapon system. It's stealth warfare against the world. It's like our utilities have been taken over. Our infrastructure in our cities are taken over. There are things such as portable directed energy weapons. You know, the information is there in military documentation. And Karen is actually offering us that kind that kind of awareness from her own experience. And so what she's pointing to is this incredible network that's been set up to as, as a tool of mass genocide, you know, through microwaves and people don't even know it. So there's a whole system plus there are so-called non-lethal weapons being used at the level of law enforcement, at the level of the FBI, at the level of NSA security, and at the level of, you know, the whole civilian proxy army that they have, that they are using through the fusion centers and so forth. And, and, you know, and it's linked via cell phones, linked via little electronic devices, transducers, sensors of different kinds. And, you know, the whole idea of implants as well, microchip implants and nanotech implants that, you know, nanotech, of course, neural dust raining down on us and so forth. Um, and and you, in a sense, it's, it's, it's um, what Karen blew the whistle on and the, the electromagnetic um, warfare system is the reason why the NSA is collecting all our data, it seems. It's to take us mm -hmm. out. It's to know who to take out. Um, exactly. when, when they are in deep capture, as they are obviously are, you know, then that's, that's dangerous. That's an international issue here because we don't know who they're going to take out. You know, journalists have been dying. Journalists are still dying. Police officers are dying around the world. Uh, math prodigies have been dying. And somebody is taking people out systematically. You know, and from now on, we have to analyze every single heart attack, every single brain tumor, you know, and all these things that are happening in key investigators, because they can be caused by this weapon system and it's active and it's using NSA. It's using NSA. So literally, you know what, Ramola, you should call the NSA every day and say, we need an update now. Because as, you know, as we figured out, they, the world has saturated with agents. They have infiltrated our embassies. All our embassies are spies. That's why the German ambassador didn't help me. All the journalists seem to be spies and working for either the CIA or the other intelligence agencies. We don't have any journalists left apart from Euromola. We don't have any ambassadors left. We have to be our own journalists and ambassadors and, and start doing international re relations, DIY, to solve this international crisis because the people who are in charge of it can't seem to be able to do their job. And that's shocking. It is. Yeah. Nine, uh, in 2009, I actually contacted Siobhan Gorman of the World, uh, Wall Street Journal, and I told her what was going on. At, at that point in time, NSA, their own security people were stalking and harassing me using the gang stalking protocol. And I talked to her about it, and she said other journalists had reported almost exactly the same type of stalking harassment by NSA. In 2009, she told me that. Um, <laughs> so it's incredible. NSA, after 9-11, uh, and it was, this is borne out in other articles, basically started this protocol to stalk and harass and shut up people who might say something about 9-11 that they didn't want to be said. All right. After 9-11, you have to understand, a lot of people understand this, but for those people who don't know, after 9-11, NSA started looking inward at the United States. The, the NSA was originated in the 1950s under a different name, and I forget which, what, uh, what uh, name it was, but they became the NSA and their charter is to look only at foreigners in foreign countries. They have no jurisdiction inside the United States. 
if a foreign bad guy would come to the United States for whatever reason, legally they had to inform the FBI, Joe bad guy is in Connecticut, so you take over watching him. They could not do it. If Joe bad guy was in Denmark and they found that he was talking to Bob Smith, who was an American, they were disallowed to record or report on Bob Smith's end of the conversation. So they were restricted to foreign bad guys on foreign soil. And yet all of us are now being looked at as bad guys by the NSA that has no jurisdiction here. And I would point out again to people that if I were a foreign country and I looked at the United States with all of our power and all of our weaponry and the technology and saw it eating its own young, I would be very worried about that country because if, the, if it wants to kill its own people for nothing, which is what it's doing, then it, is, it has uh, fewer uh, restrictions on wanting to go next door and kill your people, Canada, Mexico, Russia, China. So we are making ourselves a target by this type of abuse of our own people and our incessant uh, obsession with developing preemptive weapons that will totally destroy the balance of power with nuclear weaponry. We are becoming a danger that cannot be ignored. Yes, and I think I think this is this is um, I think on one hand I, I completely agree, and this danger is emanating from the U.S. And the one thing I would like to say is that everybody should look at that because something very similar has happened all around the world because it's not just NSA. So today we're focusing on NSA, but I can say the same thing about MI6, about the BND and the NDB, all three of those I have experienced with, sadly. They paraded in front of me what they are doing. And I can confirm that the deep capture of NSA is identically mirrored by what happened with MI5, MI6, the BND in Germany, the, the German Federal Intelligence, and here in Switzerland. And that's bad news, because it means that there's some sort of global deep capture by some foreign entity. So we better identify who these people are, what they want, and how we're gonna clear them out of the system. And, and today is a wake up call, you know, because your case, Karen, is, is the cannery and the gold mine. If that cannot be solved, we're in for a very rough ride that we might not survive anywhere around the world. Because this is not a situation that can be modeled in any way. You know, we, we don't know. So clearly there's some sort of foreign entity taking over intelligence agencies, putting them into deep capture. But it seems to be so pervasive that it goes all the way down to the local level. It seems to have wormed its way into local law enforcement mm -hmm. as much as national or international. And, and that's bad news because suddenly you're looking at a situation whereby you don't know who your enemies are. It's, it's a setup for an all out worldwide civil war, right? And that's, no one can model that. No one can predict the outcome of that because it means that at all scales, at the nation state scale, at the local scale, you pit people against people. And then, you know, personal interests take over. So this is, this is not even like a world war anymore because, you know, we have to remember most world wars were staged. It seems that this will be the first world war that will not be staged, which means it's totally non-linear. You know, everybody will start attacking everybody because they don't know who their enemies are. I think that's why they're, uh they're keeping Karen alive because the deep state's <laughs> vulnerability is from people within. And they want to show that if you're within and you fail, uh, we're going to, we're going to make your life hell. Yeah. I think that's why uh, their only vulnerability is from within. If the police start, stop, start policing and stop uh, intimidating, if the NSA starts doing their job, which I, I'm not sure what their job is. <laughs> not <talk>. anymore. <laughs> uh, Who knows uh, anymore? <laughs> yeah. So, no, yeah, no one knows, really. So if people start uh, waking up and realizing that they're working against themselves, that the, they're working against humanity, and start bailing, well, this has got to be a, a, 
uh, an example to everybody. See what happens to Karen. She can't even sit in her house sometimes. She has to go outside and protect herself from these waves. They climb in trees and put, put energy weapons directed at her. I mean, her life is horrible because of what she's done, the wonderful thing that she's done. But Paul, you see, that is exactly the issue. They're, they're trying to make an example of Karen. They're trying to say, look, if you whistleblow, if you speak out, this is what you're going to get. And they're trying to send a message to the rest of America saying, look what we can do. You know, because basically what they are doing and what the media also is doing, because, you know, as you know, this is the collaborative media, complicit media, working hand in hand with the deep state by their silence. They are striving to silence, discredit, and marginalize Karen Stewart, the most important whistleblower of our time, of our century, because she can give you the insider story about electromagnetic weapons that are currently being used on humanity. Yeah. She is being silenced for that reason. You know? I, and, I agree. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just one not, sentence. I, I just have to get in one sentence sideways and I have to make my excuses because I have to, um, I have to go. I, I think that's absolutely right. And you know what, um, what Paul said and what you said is 100% right. They are silencing her for this. Um, you know, I think had they left Karen alone, the world would not have woken up to how important she is. So their strategy entirely misfired. By doing that, they paraded the deep capture of the NSA to the entire world they paraded the deep capture of even her local police force, so it must be pervasive, and they have raised the, the global alarm over the biggest threat to mankind by, by attacking Karen. That's, that's that is correct. Across two states, Florida and Maryland. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and, and fitting everything together, you know, unwittingly, these people have given us, a, they have given us the person from NSA who I think is certified by NSA to be the most honest person at NSA because she has, I don't know how many lie detector tests that she had to take routinely at NSA, passing them with flying colors. So they certified her as the most honest person and then they started attacking her and now she actually told us what happened to her. That's a wake up call for the entire world. So we, are, we all have to be watching carefully what's happening to Karen. And Admiral Mike Rogers better stop her targeting by tomorrow because we're running out of time in this global situation here. It could get hot in a second and this problem needs to be solved by yesterday. So if, if Admiral Mike Rogers could find the telephone in his office, if maybe the secretary could kindly point him to the button he has to press on the intercom to make a phone call, that would be nice. It would be globally appreciated. And it will tell them when they're pressing that button to turn off, you know, the targeting, that they can press all the buttons at the same time. If they exactly. find the one button, they can press them all. Exactly. And don't, Admiral Mike Rogers, don't mistake it with the nuclear button. That might also look like <laughs> it's not the one with the extra plastic covering that needs the key. Not that one. That's not the telephone. <laughs> and turn it off, not on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anyway, I have to go, ladies. So, you know. Best of uh, luck to you. Bye, Bye. Thank Catch you. Bye. Bye-bye, Bye. Bye -bye, yeah. yeah, there's so many aspects of Karen's story that, you know, we could focus on because, um, and maybe we should take a couple minutes to go through some of those aspects because it would help show how NSA security was actually involved and how um, Karen is offering incredible disclosure about them. Um, for instance, when, go ahead, Paul, did you have something to say? No, I just, uh, I was just listening to you. Uh, oh, okay. So, okay. So when, uh, what, one of the key aspects of a story is that, um, it, well, actually I should start with Inspector General George Ellard. And that really is how I started my article because last year, George Ellard was fired. He was fired by the Dernsa because of a case of whistleblower retaliation. He actually retaliated against somebody inside NSA who worked, I think, in financial services or something. 
he didn't give this guy a, who who had reported corruption, who had reported corruption internally in the NSA. And then this this person started to be sidelined. I don't know the name because when I looked at the articles, there was no name that I could find for this particular whistleblower. So, oh. right. So I, I could not. Yeah, I've forgotten. I, I have seen his name. I just have forgotten it. Oh, okay. I so. Oh, that's all right. But it's not being reported. His name is not in the in the in whatever coverage is out there. You know, from Shadowproof and all those places. Um, so some guy from the NSA who came forward and was a, a whistleblower. He reported corruption, and then he was sidelined. He wasn't given a project. He wasn't given work. You know, in a deliberate attempt to sort of move him out of the organization. And that case, for some reason, came to the forefront and caused the firing of Inspector General George Ellard. Now, Inspector General George Ellard was the IG in charge when Karen was working there and when Karen was presenting her complaints and her requests for an investigation. So in a sense, a great deal can be laid at this particular IG's door because he did not respond to her requests. Right? Isn't that right, Karen? Yes, I contacted a liaison with a new office. I had moved from the um, incredibly evil office at Weapons in Space, had laterally transferred to get away from them. And when I felt safe, I contacted the Inspector General's office and talked to a liaison. Uh, I believe his name was Mike. Um, and I told him my story. And I told it to him in generalities, you know, just as a summary. And he said, well, that's exactly the, the type of thing that we're here to investigate. So gather up the names and the particulars of what's going on, and then I will get back to you or get back to me tomorrow. So I did. You know, I, get, I got time, date, person, you know, all the names. And then when I gave it to him the next day uh, via email, he ignored me. So I ended up calling him and saying, did you get what I sent to you? And within 24 hours, he had become insanely hostile. And I couldn't believe it because we had had a, a nice conversation. Um, I had even suggested to him at the time, I said, what I, what I think would be wise in this case is if you, as the Inspector General Office, went to Weapons in Space and said, we'd like to review all of the internal resumes for the people you just promoted in 2005 and 2004, just for an internal audit. And then I sent him a copy of my internal resume that had been submitted but pulled. Um, and so I said, here's my resume. If this particular person, Margarita, if her resume has plagiarized mine, then we have a problem because I can prove this is my work. This is my six month series of intelligence reports that my bosses told me estimated had saved 2000 lives or more during Operation Iraqi Freedom, okay, during the invasion. So I said, this is a way to go in and take a look and see if, if her resume upon which she was promoted bears no resemblance to mine, then there's not a problem. So this avoids calling people names and accusing them. And he said, I like that idea. So he left the phone conversation, first phone conversation, claiming to uh, want to take action and do things the way that I had suggested. And a day later, all of a sudden, he tells me he went to the inspector general with my case. The inspector general says, we don't care why anybody's promoted because it's all subjective. So they had no interest in hearing my story at all. And then when I insisted that it was, it had um, validity and that it should be uh, investigated, the next day he was leaving my office, my new office. He was coming out of the manager's area and he seemed very furious. And so he left the office and I uh, talked to my management. Uh, one of my actual uh, chief uh, office chief came out and talked to me and she said, Karen, why are you pursuing this? And I looked at her in shock and I said, justice? Really? And at that she turned around and went back into her office. But it was after that, that I started noticing that I was being investigated and maligned, mm -hmm. slandered, and mm -hmm. very uh, overtly stalked inside of NSA by security personnel, men, and then they took it outside to following me back and forth to work. 
and then more going into stores, et cetera, et cetera, as if I had done something wrong by asking why and credit for my work and given a double promotion. Oh, why has this happened? And that brought the whole house down on me. And I think it's very significant that, you know, you spoke to this person at the IG's office and the first time you spoke to him, he was super receptive. He was very open to your story. He was very interested in doing the right thing, the, the thing that he was hired to do and investigate mm -hmm. the, your story. And then he goes to the IG and the, the entire scenario changes the very next day. Jo Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, what yeah. happened? Why is yeah. this valid one day and not valid? And if they're not interested in promotion anomalies or uh, trading sexual favors for, uh, for um, promotions, why are they there? Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that your supervisor then turns to you and says, why are you exploring this? So it seems to suggest that there were people in upper management who were kind of keen to, to not let your investigation go forward. Now, right? she they had been not... very nice. She had been very nice, but they obviously came in and threatened her because that was not her personality. Ah, very interesting. So it's very so telling see, to me. Yes, very, very telling because it, it talks about precisely what Catherine was talking about. This is deep capture. This is somebody who is exerting control very obviously inside the organization. Right. And then the other aspect too, how the stalking and surveillance be begins inside NSA for you. And all of a sudden you're reported to the FBI, there's an FBI investigation and you're sent down to take these polygraphs and you're sent and during the course of the polygraph, they really try to get you worked up so that the polygraph, which is supposed to be conducted, I believe under calm and normal circumstances didn't it happen. should be neutral neutral in fact yeah um now they will give you a polygraph and a psyche valve every let's say five years they shoot for that maybe seven years but they're going to try to reevaluate people to make sure they haven't been turned because they have a top secret clearance all right so nsa security throughout my entire career would advertise, and we're talking about posters and little campaigns to tell people who worked at NSA, if you find that you are outside of NSA and you're getting undue attention from people who look maybe like they're foreign or they have an undue interest in your work, let us know because you could be targeted by a foreign entity um, thinking that they could turn you. So do let us know because we need to protect you and NSA. And yet, when I went to them and reported exactly the same thing, they said, oh, you're crazy. With no, yeah. no investigation whatsoever. And I had license plates and I had images of people and I had accounts of strange behavior. But for me, they weren't interested. Everybody else, but not for me. Yeah, and you kind of really pulled the rug out from under them because at the time that they kind of demoted you, they kind of red badged you, right? And which is such a very strange NSA type thing to do, like when people are um, being harassed inside the NSA, they're being red badged, which means their clearances are being pulled, right? Your security clearance was pulled, which means the job that you were hired to do was no longer yours according to them and they moved you to a different office they moved you actually to a travel office something that you named a punishment job right and the yeah and the irony is that as you were working there and looking out the window you would see the same people who were stalking you in howard county maryland in your neighborhood and in your community the very same people suddenly wearing badges blue badges and green badges as either nsa security employees or nsa security contractors and walking into the building to report for work at NSA Security. Right. It was insane. I mean, that, is, that was stellar that you caught that. <laughs> well, and, you know, the other thing that is stellar, um, Karen, about your case is that you are an artist. You are a caricaturist. So you were actually able to draw their faces down. There's some rule about not being able to take photographs. Is that correct? You cannot have a camera on NSA premises whatsoever. So you can't even. Karen just froze. Vehicularly. So when I started to see these same men 
getting in and out of their own cars instead of the cars that NSA gave them to use to stalk me, I started noting the license plates. And when I could, I started drawing their features so that I could show the police, you know, this guy in a beige Buick, here's the tag, here's his facial features, he's stalking me. Um, can you investigate and see what's going on? So I was able to give images to the police that NSA did not expect me to be able to. Yeah, so that's absolutely brilliant that you were able to do that. Because, and you've given me a couple of those images and they're in my article. So people can see that, can see those images in the article of these people who were pretty much stalkers and then actually turn out to be working at mm -hmm. NSA security as either contractors or employees. Undeniably, they were reporting to the security building. Mm -hmm. Voila, you know, amazing. proof. Amazing. Yes. Absolutely amazing. And so when you reported that, that was when NSA security said, you need external psych evaluations at this point. And they sent you out into the community to go find a psychiatrist and get an evaluation and start getting treatment. That was their big idea. Right. Because it they badly wanted to name you mentally ill. Right. Being mentally, well, okay, I will, I'll, I'll refrain from comment at this point. <laughs> I'm missing Catherine for the, for the Greek girl. <laughs> well, in any, well, in I mean, any case, they, they sent you out. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say they had stalked and harassed me from 2006 when I reported the uh, incident to the IG and stalked me until early 2009, and they were obviously getting desperate to provoke me because I, I was telling my friends what was going on. And uh, I was telling them, you know, these people are either corrupt or they're the stupidest people on the face of the earth. Because, you know, uh, when you work for NSA, you have to take a polygraph and a psych eval, like I said, every five years. So are they so very stupid that they can't read their own psych evals that tell you somebody's crazy and delusional and they allow them to work there? Or is there nothing wrong with the psych eval and they're trying to say that once you report something that makes you crazy and therefore, you know, you need to have your clearance revoked and be fired. Well, in 2009, they were getting desperate to provoke me. So they started doing things like they had poisoned, like I said, a, uh, a beloved family pet, a beautiful 13 month old Newfoundland male named Sam poisoned him with a neurotoxin, Sorry. neurotoxin. And that is, probably one of the most horrible ways to go that I can think of. Okay. So they did that. And then uh, um, they started doing what I called coordinated aggressive driving attacks on me in between home and work, trying to scare me, trying to make me have a car accident, trying maybe to hurt me or maybe to kill me. So at that point in time, I went to my newer management that I'd been working for, for, you know, about three years. And again, they liked my work. We had a good relationship. We would joke back and forth. Um, but when I reported this to them, they apparently had been told to, if Karen Stewart tells you anything, just report her immediately to security. So they reported what I was saying, because I said, look, this is a farce. They've been investigating me for three years, which means they've been harassing me through for three years. Because if I had ever done anything wrong, I'd be gone. You know, the FBI would have picked me up and taken me somewhere but I haven't done anything. So they reported that I was reporting them to security. I was called down to um, the office of William Zephyr, all right? And he informed me, oh, because you've reported people um, following you and stalking you, we're pulling your clearance. We're sending you to the travel office to work on paperwork for TDYs and things like that. And there was no, what's your side of the story? There was none. You're just gone. Oh my goodness. So I was sent away. I didn't even have time to clear off my desk. I just was sent, you know, to the travel office. And uh, there you're treated like a pariah because people are told this is a bad person, you know. And um, at that point in time, like, like you were saying, I started noticing people parking near my car, you know, in the same parking lot who were going to the, the travel office. And those were my stalkers. There was no doubt. Absolutely no doubt. So I took, I gathered information, went to the Howard County Police and said, these people have been stalking me. And I made the mistake of saying that it's employer stalking. I should have just said stalking and you investigate and you tell me. But so that's, that was a mistake on my part. But uh, NSA uh, was told, NSA security was told by the Howard County Police that I had tags and images of people from NSA who were stalking me. And 
I would say within a day or two later, I was called down by NSA security and they said, we want to hear your side of the story now. I said, really? You've taken me out of my job and you've put me in a red badge status. And now you want to hear my story? You know? And they said, well, yes. So I told them what was going on. And then the person uh, basically went to, I think she went to one of the, the, psychi the psychiatrists or the psychologist, tried to go to her, uh, to the same person who had threatened me saying, if you don't basically shut up about the promotion theft, we're going to go back over your site. Uh, um, psychiatric evaluations over the past 20 plus years and find a problem. Yeah, and I think that's huge, by the way, and I hope I emphasize that in my article, because for, for a psychologist to so, sort of really go on the record, because you are the witness, you're the reporting witness at this mm -hmm. point in time, she's actually telling you to your face, you better drop this inquiry, you better drop this investigation, or I'm going to frame you. Yeah. Now, it's... I'm going to go back in your file and find something. I'm going to make a big deal out of it. And I'm going to frame you as psychologically inept, as paranoid, delusional, or whatever. Right, right. And every single test that I took was outsourced to be graded. So how they were going to do that, I don't know. But every single test I ever took with them came back perfectly fine. In fact, when they uh, basically, well, when they basically said, well, uh, we'll go back to the police. So the police tells NSA that I know that it's them stalking me. I have proof, not just that I think it is, but I have proof. So NSA then comes and does the interview and says, okay, uh, after the interview, which I thought should have cleared me up, except I suspected they really didn't care my, about my side of the story at that point anyway. But um after that, I was told, well, we, now we think that you're crazy and dangerous. Really? Now I'm crazy and dangerous? And we need to take you... Well, that, uh, really, that really shows the extent yeah. to which they were afraid of you at that point. Because they recognized you were an incredible threat, both as you know, yeah. a reporter and as an artist, being able to capture images of these stalkers. Oh, they didn't like that at all. <laughs> In fact, um, every so often I would know that I was passing somebody in the hall who was part of this because they would do this. Oh. <laughs> they just, and, you know, you're like, you're like, you know, the, you, we don't need FBI biometric uh, recognition with you around, <laughs> Karen. <laughs> you just need to take a look at her face and you've got it down and you can put it down on paper. I mean, you have an incredible talent. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I just, I found it hilarious when people try to walk past me going, hello, good day. <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, that's normal. <laughs> right. Protecting their privacy. Huh? But uh, yeah, and, and so at that point, they told me I was crazy and dangerous, and I was going to be put on admin leave, and that, oh, by the way, you need to see a psychologist or psychiatrist, and tell them that you are paranoid and delusional, so they can treat you for it. And I said, you know what? I will hire my own psychologist, but I'm not telling them that I'm crazy and delusional. I will let them decide that themselves. What I will tell them is that I'm being illegally harassed by my employer who is making false psychiatric accusations against me. And they were furious that I even said that to them. Well, of course I said that to them. And so I did go. And um, the gentleman I chose, uh, thank God I chose well. And um, he's a senior psychologist and very much in demand for legal cases. And he, I spent uh, several weeks going to him, talking to him for over an hour. And he, and he said at, at the third session, I think third or fourth session, he leaned across the table and he said, Mrs. Stewart, if you were paranoid delusional, I just might have noticed by now. So now let's talk about the abuse that you're being put through. Yeah, really, that is the point, isn't it? You mm -hmm. were being put through ex an extreme amount of abuse. You were being traumatized in the workplace. You were being exposed to hostility in the workplace. Mm -hmm. You know, discrimination based on your work credit being stolen, et cetera, et cetera. So... I think it's interesting that they use the word crazy. Because crazy <laughs> is a psychological term. Psychologists don't use crazy. It's a legal oh. term. It's a legal term. Oh, interesting. And it's also interesting that they actually told Karen, tell the psychologist that you're paranoid and delusional. 
Yes. Or, or the psychiatrist. Tell the psychiatrist you're paranoid and delusional and that you need treatment. I mean, what absolute nonsense. Is that what patients do when they visit psychiatrists? Hello, I'm paranoid. Can I have a drug? <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I mean, what were they thinking? Clearly, NSC security seems to have totally lost it at this point. You know, they were completely like flailing about, trying to frame Karen in any which way possible, and failing miserably, and kind of advertising their idiots in, in the in the process as well. Well, so, I do think they're idiots, but the the problem is, um, just like if you have a gorilla in your house, that's not a, exactly a genius of a creature in your house, but he has a lot of power. So when he flails about, he can cause damage. But so these baby people are basically That's gorillas. That's true, and this is called abuse of power, and that really yeah. is the core of the story. You know, both in your case, sort of at the micro level, and you know, in all our cases at the macro level, because what they've done to you, they are literally doing to us. Yes. You know, and this whole phenomenon of the TI, the the whole TI phenomenon, is simply an extension of what's happening to you. It's an extrapolation. Yes. You know, so, I actually got an email after, I think, doing your article, uh, Cher's Eve, and you had done articles on me. And I got an email that said, and it was a very, it was from somebody I'd never heard of before. And the man said, if you keep, he, first of all, he said he was a TI, which I don't believe now at all. But then he said, if you keep quiet, I can protect you. Oh, my. And I, and I was stunned, absolutely stunned. So I wrote him back an email and I said, even if I keep quiet and I can, and you can protect me, I said, what good does that do all the rest of the people in this situation? I said, no, I never Karen, heard from him again. Oh my, Karen, this is why you are a hero. You are a national hero and you should be celebrated as a national hero because you are somebody who is standing up and speaking out. And, and that really is what I want to emphasize, that, you know, what you bring to the table is extraordinary. And even though, you know, it's like we're living in the twilight zone at this point in time, because of mainstream media and because of deep capture of the mainstream media, so there is no larger awareness of what you are exposing. But within us, within our sphere at this point in time, and anybody who is watching us speak at this point in time, we know that what you're doing is tremendous. And seriously, we all thank you for standing up for the rest of us. Because we don't have your voice. You are somebody who's worked from, you know, you are someone who's um, speaking out as a voice of authority, a voice of influence, someone who's worked from inside, you know, the nation's most premier security and intelligence agency. And you're able to speak out about this, having had, you know, 20 years of experience with weapons in space and so forth. Mm -hmm. So your, your voice carries a great deal of weight. And in fact, I want to move on in the, in the story. So at this point where um, they send you out to get a psych eval and you come back and your psychiatrist says you're mentally sound. And in fact, you have previous psychiatric evaluations that say you're the most stable, the most emotionally and mentally put together person that they've ever encountered. And this was the head of security psych services, right? He was the former head. He was the former head of um, security psychological services, apparently when they weren't in deep capture. Mm -hmm. But he had done a baseline on me in 2005 and they started attacking me in 2006. But he had stated that to me and he said that um, I was one of the most stable um, uh, mentally and emotionally that he'd ever met. Which I had never expected him to say, but yes, that's wonderful. And you also, I have also looked at letters. Uh, this from alarmed. This alarmed Dr. Dina Wyshynski, and I'm saying her name because she's been in the news before. She's the one who threatened me, but this alarmed her, and I think that's why they went to all the trouble they did to try to set me up and harass me for several years, trying to push me out, because I had had just had right. that evaluation. So how are you going to say somebody has changed? from being very stable to being wholly and totally unstable the next year. No, they had absolutely no leg to stand on. They were sort of no. grasping at straws at that point in time. Right, they right. They were desperate. And, um, you know, they weren't able to prove anything whatsoever. And then shortly after, it sounds like there was a, you, you kind of, um, they also, well, you got fired pretty soon after, right? After that, you were, um, you were terminated. 
Well, what they did was they, they put me on admin leave March 13th, 2009, and then Stockton harassed me until about mid-July when I actually got out and talked to the proxy stalkers and told them what was really going on. And then they started having problems with the proxy stalkers. They uh, had been meeting every week at Phelps Luck Community House. And then all of a sudden, after I talked to several of the people, told them the real story and told them, check with your NSA friends. Because if you don't know NSA people, you have friends who know NSA people. Because people in the rank and file knew those were my reports. They knew it. Of course. And I was yeah. told by several friends, they said, oh, yeah, everybody knows those were your reports, Karen. And nobody understands what happened to you or why. It doesn't make sense. So it was only managerial lies that said somebody else had done the work. But I told these people, I said, you check what I'm telling you with your friends. And then I noticed at the Phelps Luck uh, Community Center, maybe two Saturdays, maybe three Saturdays, um, they had police called to break up fights inside of the community center, one of which uh, spilled out into the parking lot. So these people were basically approaching uh, NSA and maybe Howard County Police saying, are you lying to us? Is this person being persecuted for being a whistleblower or is she some terrible person like you told us and it wasn't working so uh, July 12th all of the stockings stopped dead cold for five years for five years and I sued NSA it, with the um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission it, it, got, it accepted the, um, the lawsuit and it's on unfortunately it's sitting on docket right now and then in 2015, when I had my uh, lawyer subpoena corroborating evidence showing that NSA executive Eric Hageman had actually indeed burglarized my home, taken keys and bugged the house, that is when NSA sent uh, people down to Tallahassee, Florida, where I had moved to organize yet more stalking harassment. So, and, and, we've, and I've been stalked since um, April 2015 ever since. Yeah, it's absolutely extra incredible. And, and they also started using directed energy weapons shortly yes. after. They had InfraGuard in Tallahassee under the FDLE, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. They had InfraGuard dupes, stalk and harass me 24-7 from April 2015 on. And then in late November 2015, they introduced the electronic harassment, and they have been using that ever since uh, November 2015. I think they got frustrated, like, she's not intimidating, so we're just going to kill her. Yeah. And, you know, we, uh, as you know, I reported earlier on that article where you had actually been, you've taken incredible recordings, you've gotten great equipment, you've gotten great meters, and you've taken recordings of these pulses of EMF coming in mm -hmm. and hitting your person. And you took these recordings to the sheriff's office, I believe, right? And, and Tallahassee. And Tallahassee yes. police. Mm -hmm. And so you showed them. You actually showed them physical evidence mm -hmm. of electromagnetic harassment. And what did they do? They just blew you off, right? They, they did not even acknowledge it. Right. Um, I've been complaining to them, and I learned in uh, paperwork that they started calling me crazy uh, in December of 2015. So they were blowing me off immediately and uh yeah. in a, in two, it took me two or three months to get uh, equipment that i could record you know take an iphone and, and record what the meter was doing and so i showed it to a few deputies and they said we don't know what that means i said do you understand red is a danger zone and maybe the needle shouldn't be there and they were like okay and i said well you've got florida state university in tallahassee florida You've also got something called the MAG lab, which deals with, guess what? Electromagnetic radiation. I said, why don't you go to these experts and have them interpret this for you to tell you that this is dangerous? And they wouldn't do it. They refused to do it. The Leon County Sheriff's Department absolutely would not do it. They had made their assessment that what I was talking about, they didn't understand, therefore, they weren't ignorant, I must be just crazy. You know, this is really hysterical because it's like they didn't understand, but they're being informed of an expert in their vicinity whom they could very well go to for corroboration or 
for advice. And basically, they were taking a stance, and that stance was, we're not going to listen. So mm -hmm. that's really interesting when local law enforcement takes that stance. In this day and age, when everybody knows we're living in an electromagnetic soup anyway, with cell towers and cell antennas, do you know what I mean? So we're living in a different time period. Electromagnetic radiation is a fact of life currently in today's society. And so if a person complains of electromagnetic signals of an excessive nature, coming into their homes and actually engaging in pulse behavior, you know, because that's the difference. Mm -hmm. We're not, this is not ambient EMF that any of us are reporting. We are reporting pulsed EMF that's very directional and that is actually impinging directionally as if, as if in a beam on specific bodies, on specific human bodies. So for them to not at this point appeal to an expert just kind of points up that this is not really an error on their part, but is an act of deliberate volition. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an act of deliberate stonewalling, of, of yeah. deliberate obstructionism. Yeah, that's why they call it a police state. Not a government. <laughs> right, exactly. A police state. So yeah, I guess so, because yeah, the police, the police sort of closes the door. It's like, you can't go further. Here's, you know, here's what we are going to say, and this is our word. And, you know, our word is going to run, not yours. Right. If we say the sky is purple, the sky is purple. Um, yeah. what, another interesting incident was I got frustrated with the police, and I said, you know what? The fire department should have uh, hazmat uh, equipment. So I went to the fire department in the nearest my house in Tallahassee, and I brought the meter that I was using, and I brought a video showing the media, the, the meteor doing this. And it obviously was going into the danger zone. And it, again, that means it was pulsed. And so I showed it to the people at the fire department. And I said, this is a reading taken at my house. And I said, what do you think of that? And they said, oh, that's not good. And I said, well, do you have a hazmat team? They said, well, we have a guy. And so I, they said, well, let's follow you out to your house and we'll see if he can come and take some readings on his equipment. I said, that would be great. So they call somebody, he meets us out there. Well, he's got a Kiger counter. I said, that's not going to measure anything that, you know, electromagnetic radiation is non ionizing and a Geiger counter will only measure ionizing radiation, which if he measures ionizing radiation, we're all in trouble, you know? And so when we're discussing this, the fact that he doesn't have the proper equipment and he's supposed to be hazmat for Tallahassee, a sheriff's deputy comes out who's a senior and he tells the fire department people, don't pay attention to her, leave, she's crazy. Well, they came out because they saw a video of the meter reading that alarmed them. How does my sanity affect a, me, a meter reading that's videotaped and clearly videotaped at my home because I was showing where I was taping it? So they took their orders and left. Yeah, it's amazing how it's this, this word crazy keeps popping up. It doesn't, isn't it? It's, it's how they've been kind of instructed. Mm -hmm. This is the modus operandi, to call anybody crazy who mentions the word electromagnetic radiation. And it's a real joke, given, given what's going on, given the fact that this stuff can be actually measured on a meter. We're talking about basic physics here. Well, was my meter crazy? Yeah, really. That is the question <laughs> to ask. Well, that is the question. To ask. I also called the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Forensics Unit, and I told them separately. I said, I have, you know, I introduced myself. I said, by the way, I have a meter that is showing me that there is electromagnetic radiation pulsing in this area of Tallahassee, could you come out and measure it and make sure that your meters are saying the same thing and interpret it for me? And the man on the phone, um, I think his name was Jason, he said, well, hmm, electromagnetic, that sounds like the feds. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yes, um, let me check and see if I'm allowed to do anything about this. And he got off the phone and said, he, well, he said he would call back, but he never called back. And he never answered my calls after that. So he admitted to me it had something to do with the feds, that they were doing something 
out in my neighborhood that they were told to stay out of. See, that's very interesting. I've actually, considering that I've heard a few stories from other people, yes, people have told me that it's about the feds. Local police have told them it's, it's the feds. So, you know, in your case, what's really interesting is that you're here in Florida. You've moved from Maryland. And then you actually hear about the feds coming down to pay Tallahassee a visit, right? And you heard that talking to somebody at the sheriff's office or was it the local police? Um, found, sheriff's, sheriff's office. The sheriff's office. Right. And you found out that the NSA and FBI had made a special visit. They were escorted from the airport to the spot very close to your home. Not, right? not very far at all. Um, yeah, with, and they were setting up something, doing a secret exercise or something? Yes. Um, a neighbor of mine and I had heard, heard very strange booming sounds, almost like fireworks, but no fireworks. And it had gone, it was uh, happening about uh, at dusk. So had, and, and we lived on a lake. So um, if there had been fireworks, we'd have seen lights, but we saw no lights. And so at one point in time, you know, maybe a day or two after, I called the sheriff's department at her house using a speaker phone so she could hear. And I said, oh, by the way, what were the booming sounds at Lake Jackson? on such and such a date, you know, and uh, the, the sheriff's uh, deputy said, oh, the NSA and the FBI made a special trip to Tallahassee to go to the Phipps, res uh, Phipps property because they are conducting a secret exercise. And I said, really? He said, yes, we even, we, the Tallahassee, um, uh, the, actually the Leon County Sheriff's Department, we met them at the airport out there, they flew in on a special cargo plane and they had Humvees that we escorted from the police, from the um, airport to the Phipps property because they're conducting a special secret exercise with the FDLE. And I kind of smiled at that point because I knew the man had no idea what he had said to me. And his name was Jeff Cannon, Deputy Jeff Cannon. Um, but he confirmed what I was telling the neighbor. I said, those sounds, in my experience from Maryland, they use those sounds like the military does to signal the commencement or the cessation of an operation, that they don't have to use a phone or a fax or a, uh, you know, any type of messaging that can be intercepted and proven. So they just wow. use some type of sound that, that most people have no idea what it is, but those informed know what the signal means. So at, it was that okay. it was a day or two after that that I noticed that I was being stalked and harassed by civilians. Now I had been photo stalked by what turns out to be Navy personnel from Pensacola who had worked at the Naval Security Group, aka uh, Silent Warriors, because they Silent dealt War. because they dealt with directed energy weapons. So I knew there was a Navy connection. At that point, I found out that the um, Naval Security Group had its headquarters move to Fort Meade, Maryland to be co-located with NSA. So very clearly, they were working together. And I would say that's probably yeah, that, the, that's... the source of the directed energy weapons that were given out to InfraGuard and what looked to be criminal gangs. So that, that that it was kind of spearheaded by Navy security. directed energy because weapons. Navy security is running this. Drug addicts, murderers, rapists. Isn't that lovely? Really so, um, like I said, that that was incredible that the man admitted that to me. And after that, I wrote up what is uh, more or less a FOIA for the state of Florida. It is called the Sunsh Sunshine Act. And so I made a detailed request of the sheriff's department as to whether they were working with any feds at all in a project that had anything to do with me. And I submitted it and the sheriff's department refused to answer it unless I paid them $2,000 to go through their files and look for information. Oh my goodness. Well, very clearly, I could not afford to pay anybody $2,000 to do their job. Really? I mean, right. that's exactly what the F Sunshine Act or the FOIA request program is all about that you know um that they respond to public requests for information but clearly they're using i know Not even, in, even in the general federal space they use that they use this fees thing 
to put people back a little bit. Yeah. To hold people back. Two thousand dollars. I mean, originally it was one thousand something or other, and then when I inquired further, they raised the price to two thousand and above. But clearly, it was so extraordinary that NSA and FBI would come and engage in a secret exercise literally on a neighboring property. And at the time that this is happening, not only are you being stalked, you're being hit, right? Were you hit at that time with weapons? You were hit at that time, right? Well, in April of 2015, after my lawyer subpoenaed new damning evidence against NSA for my lawsuit, that is when they panicked and sent people to, NS to Tallahassee, apparently, to tell the FDLE that I'm some kind of terrorist or who knows what. So at that point in time, it was directly in, in uh, reaction to the subpoena. It's very clear. And then several months later, after I would make fun of these people, I had uh, a little shop on Cafe Press where I could make up my own bumper stickers. So I was sticking it to them, so to speak. You know, and so apparently they didn't like the fact that I was psy oping their people right back. And in late November 2015, they decided to go with the electronic harassment. And that was the first time that had ever happened to me. And it has not ceased, but for one time, which is when I went to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and asked to talk to the domestic terrorism unit made up of Mr. Kennedy and Annie White. And oddly enough, it was during the time inside FDLE that the directed energy weapons were not hitting me. I think because they weren't going to hit their own people. I had gone to the sheriff's department. I had gone to the police, Tallahassee Police Department. And they had hit me nonstop visiting both those places. So apparently don't, they don't care about their, their lesser people. But what, so once I... Once I went to the FDLE, it stopped cold and did not restart until I left the FDLE. See, that's so interesting that you went to the FDLE and you kind of experienced a cessation of these symptoms that are distinctly related to EMF pulsed radiation attack, um, you know, which can be traced to through the wall surveillance devices, which we know now that our police departments have this mm -hmm. through wall radar that they can just point through through the walls of anybody's home and see, literally see everybody in there through through the use of microwaves. And this actually relates to Kellyanne Conway's famous remark about my, microwaves being used as cameras. She didn't realize it was microwave radar that she was she should really have explained as being significant in the scenario. You know that, that that's what um, that's what. Um, is being used now, these, these devices, through world surveillance. So, and, and what they do is they use pulse Doppler radar. So they could make I, I, a connection. Yes, um, I'm going to have to move. My, my phone is dying, so I'm going to have to plug it in. So I'm just going to move. Sure. I have to go plug it in. So, <laughs> pardon me. Yeah. So in any case, I think at this point, you know, Karen was experiencing the kind of EMF attacks that many of us have faced ever since we engaged in a little bit of activism or a little bit of speaking out or a little bit of writing um, or a little bit of reporting corruption in our communities. So I think this, uh, just to interject, to interject something here, uh, this is a great story and I'm going to send it to everybody I can to try to get coverage on this story. This is the hottest story. Uh, since Snowden, I, I really believe that. And, uh, we need that to, would be great. Good. But uh, another thing we need to, we've got about 20 minutes left. We need to emphasize, okay. I think, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, we need to emphasize the tsunami campaign because we need to keep people focused on that letter writing, the email stuff. So when we're, mm -hmm. when we're finished talking about Karen, honestly, she's got so much to say we could do 14 interviews. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I think we haven't really done a focused interview on Karen, and this has been great to actually go through and talk about different aspects of her experience. Karen, I can see you so much better. I think initially I was just saying sort of part of your head, and I wasn't oh. sure if it was my laptop or what. Oh, sorry. I'm, yeah, I had to go somewhere else and plug in, so you're in my messy office. <laughs> well, that's okay. We can see your whole face now, which, which is good. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, we can talk about the tsunami uh, campaign, which I think is brilliant. I mean, uh, uh, Catherine came up with the idea and we are trying. I mean, uh, people make a point. Well, I've written to these people before. And my emphasis is, yes, some of the very same people that you've written to probably will get these letters from us. But it's a concerted effort. They can blow away or blow off one person writing them. But can they explain why 10 people have or 20 or 100? You know, and as Catherine puts it, and there's at some point there is a liability when you ignore your constituents. I mean, you can say one person wrote me and so I didn't believe them, so I did nothing. But what if 20 people write you? Exactly. Why is that nothing? Yeah, it's not. You know, it's so, not nothing at all. It's corroboration. It's um, confirmation. Right, exactly. Well, and so I say it's worth the effort again. You know, especially, and I tell people, no matter what you think of the new president, it is a regime change. So it's very possible that newly appointed people will care. So it is worth contacting them and saying this all over again, because if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? This is the time. Also, this is phase one in Karen's, uh, Catherine's campaign. Uh, she's got follow-on activities that depend on this being done, that depend on these municipalities being put on notice. You have been right. warned, you have been told, this is what's going on in your constituency. Um, yes. So, to, to move on, we need to do this thoroughly. Yes, absolutely. And this very first phase is so vital because basically what we are doing is we're kind of doing a reprise of what many of us have been doing individually for years. You know, we've been writing to our senators, to our representatives, to the local city council, to the mayor, we've been writing to the governor general, to the governor, the attorney general, etc., etc., and going nowhere. You know, our letters have been falling into a void. We've written to the ACLU, we've written to, the, to Amnesty International. We've been reporting these horrific 21st century crimes using EMF and neuro weapons on people. And we are being met with major stonewalling, complete ignoring. So at this point in time, it's literally a reprise of actions we have all taken before. But the great, the great big difference is we're doing it together. And because we're doing it together, as Karen says, you know, we are creating a kind of a wave of awareness and deliberate notifying. You know, we're putting the word out there. These are literally notifications to officials in the year 2017 to say, look, this is most definitely going on. We're here to report it. And now that we've given you our witness, you cannot come back and say later when this all comes out, because it is most definitely coming out, truth will out in the end, inevitably. When it all comes out, you cannot go back and say, we did not know, because we are telling you right now. You know, this is literally genocide brewing in their backyards, often brewed by them. With them deciding who lives and who dies, how dare they? How dare they? Yeah, this is supreme. You know, this hubris. is not life. Yeah, it is, it is. Uh, well, the one one thing I'd like to add is, you know, Catherine does have multiple levels uh, for this campaign, but something that is is also brewing are other people's efforts to out the fact that, yes, there are certain people making money on killing us using weapons, et cetera, et cetera, um, and testing out gases and uh, all that type of thing. But on the local end, people are taking out trust funds, insurance policies, claiming us to be relatives or employees. And then when they do succeed in killing us, then our deaths will pay off properties that have been taken out in our names that we never knew of. So that is also brewing. You know, and that will be a perfect follow-on to this. Yes, that is major bombshell. That's explosive. That's incredible to learn about. And if there are indeed people who are uncovering this kind of information, that needs to be reported. You know? It does, and it has, in one location, it's been reported to the FBI. We'll see what they do with it, because it will be continue to be reported if they do not put its teeth into identity theft, insurance fraud, murder. 
it, there's another angle to it. So I'm, I'm glad to say. But it's, it's horrifically depraved. The entire program is depraved from head to toe. Absolutely. That is absolutely the right word. It's depraved. It, 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 it offers uh, uh, this image of people who are absolutely perverted who are running these programs, you know, who are destroying people's lives, destroying people's bodies, and totally trying to take over human brains as well. Yeah. So there's a huge neurotech yeah. aspect to this that we haven't really been able to get into this time. We'll have to do it another time. But I see Millicent is sort of trying to get in. So. Hi, no. Hi, Millicent. Hi. Hi, Millicent. Hi. We were, we're talking so glad about you're about us, Millicent. Millicent will be so featured next week. Yes. That's right. She's got a very important story. Very important. Yes, and I'm working on it currently, and I apologize. I'm taking forever with it, but it's a very complex and a very interesting story, and... Um, it's also a story that will really point up the horror of what is going on, of how people are using this technology, often classified technology, and exploiting it and exploiting human lives in order to test out this, this technology, to experiment with it, and to operate it for nefarious ends, you know, for, for literally means of personal vendetta, personal retaliation, and um, personal manipulation of somebody else's life. So Millicent's story is going to be very, very important in the national narrative. And, um, you know, I'm so glad, Millicent, that we are, a that we've be been able to, to uh, that, that, you're, that you're coming forward, that you're really open to publicizing your story, you know, at this point in time. And so I'm really happy that I'm working on it and that we're, to next week, we'll be able to talk about it in great detail. Well, I'm I'm glad that you are, are are working on this too because my mind is one of those who is being sought to be controlled totally. Um, mm -hmm. I seem to be hooked up to a what may be a blue brain computer or or part of the blue brain project, and it's miserable. It's miserable having someone else trying to control your every thought. It's uh, upsetting when they try to define your reality to you in an attempt to make you what they decide. Uh, I'm so glad that that's not what God decided. And so I continue to fight for his plan for, for my life and to reject those who want to do things or use me in ways that God never intended. Absolutely. And I commend your, you know, your courage and your sense of self, because ultimately that's, those are the things that we have in this fight, because we are living in a time of history when newer technology is, has come to a state of, of, of being used that's simply extraordinary. People have no idea to what level neurotech has come today. We do, and that's also because of mainstream media. You know, media keeps awareness of neurotech down to the minimum. Even mainstream neuroscience has come to an extraordinary level today. And, you know, we're really talking about black bag operations and black ops and special access projects and classified neurotech that is being used against people. We're talking really about an extension of MKUltra in the present time period. And we're talking about remote behavior modification and remote brain modification using the techniques of electromagnetic radiation modification that MKUltra discovered, you know, through, through their very many experiments. So it's actually extraordinary that um, this stuff is not being talked about in mainstream media. They are, th these are the stories of the 21st century. And mainstream media has lost its opportunity to cover them entirely leaving us in the space, you know, to cover these stories and to cover this awareness. I think it's interesting that we have Karen that shows a look at the deep state from the deep state. And we have Melissa Lawson, who's telling us she's been undergoing this for so long. She's like a historical reference all the way back to the Tuskegee experiments and how they've been suffocating us uh, down through the years. She, she gives a historical perspective. I think that's her 
her piece in addition to what's going on with her today. That's very true, there, because there is a continuum here. And I think the very fact that these kinds of experiments are being carried on today is because of the precedent that's been set for themselves, you know, by the DOD over time, happily experimenting on whole bodies of citizens, whether it's people in the military or, you know, groups of citizens who just happen to be living near army bases or naval bases or whatever. That's where you see these, these um, experiments being carried out. A group of scientists, and that's the story, I think, of um, the plutonium radiation experiments. Right, Millicent? Because we were talking about Oak Ridge, and, and that's Tennessee, right? The area that you come from. That's exactly right. I am in, in Middle Tennessee. Um, and what Oak Ridge is, is in West Tennessee, East Tennessee. However, it has a big um, association with Vanderbilt University Medical Center who is also written up in the, in the book entitled The Plutonian Files uh, that was written by I an author by the name Coleman. Right. Um, Oak Ridge is constantly involved in research, subject, uh, research projects with Vanderbilt. So me being a former employee of Vanderbilt and also suspicious that they are, part, well, I do know, I, ha I have it in black and white, that they are also using me for research uh, subjects, and it's dual, and that's what's so cool about it. It becomes a dual project. Yes, I know, and it's this is exactly right because your experience and your your research, because you've kind of figured out what's going on in your case to a great extent. Your research really points to the complicity of universities and the complicity of hospitals. I think with the plutonium radiation experiments, it was Oak Ridge Hospital, right? The, there were like 19 patients who were injected with plutonium at Oak Ridge Hospital. And that whole town was sort of called Plutonium Town or something. Um, and that, that came out much later. And this was all at the time of the Manhattan Project because that town, I think Oak Ridge, the Knox area was um, taken over by these scientists working on the Manhattan Project. Right. There was also a, a case that came out in 1995. Vanderbilt University Medical Center had actually been uh, involved in a class action lawsuit where they had given uh, radioactive cocktails to 900 pregnant women to see how the babies developed. Those children were born with different kinds of developmental disabilities, and they've just followed them through their lives, much like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Uh, many of them died many of them had cancer. Uh, most of them had some disability or another. So um, the case was actually brought by the mother of one of those children and then they pulled in the other ones into a class action lawsuit. It was ran by uh, Leif Cabrasian Bernstein out of San Francisco, California, but it hit the national newspapers in 1995. Wow, that is just an incredible story. And that just shows the lengths to which these mad scientists are going to, they don't care, you know, whose lives they destroy. They don't care how they do it. There's no issue of ethics. There's no issue of morality. And that's really what we are seeing in today's time. That's really what we are seeing with this entire program, where people are simply being experimented on in the most grotesque ways. And when you trace back what exactly might be happening, where do we go? We find trauma-based mind control and we find MKL. Exactly. So... I'm looking at the time, Paul, and I'm wondering if uh, to the end of the hour is that? Yeah, I was kind of letting you go because think this is this is the most important thing on YouTube right now. <laughs> it's, and this is the only place you can get it right here. Yeah, uh, I think that's. I'm going to send this podcast to different uh, people who consider themselves journalists and challenge them <laughs> to do some journalistic uh, endeavors on this. Uh, because we're exposing so much here. But uh, so we should wrap it up today. Why don't we do, uh, all your websites are listed below. So uh, if anybody wants to contact you guys or look at your website, you can just go below here. But uh, why don't we go around and have uh, final statements or goodbyes or whatever you'd like to say, and then we'll, we'll sign off for this episode of Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Go ahead. Do you want to start, uh, Ramola? 
Sure, yeah, thank you so much for having this. And you know, I'm glad we were able to do this focus on whistleblower retaliation and on Karen's story in particular, because I can't emphasize enough how important Karen is to this cause and how um, necessary her voice is and how essential her voice is. And, and also to point out once more that Karen Stewart, although she is a whistleblower who is completely marginalized in mainstream media, is completely the focus of our attention in alternate and independent media because we recognize that Karen Stewart is bigger than Snowden because what she's pointing to, what she's able to bear witness to and give voice to is precisely the experience of thousands of people in the US and around the world who are experiencing um, remote access and remote influencing technologies through electromagnetic radiation and through neurotech and through implantation and so forth. And these are huge, huge bits of disclosure. And um, it's, it's astonishing and absolutely shocking to me that mainstream media is not covering it. But in any case, you know, it, it offers us the space to begin to cover and to expose this. And that's what we're doing. So I'm really, really grateful to Karen. I can't, I can't emphasize enough. Thank you, Karen, on behalf of everybody. Um, in this well, thank country. you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, without people basically risking their necks to give us forums, then voices in the wilderness don't do anything, you know, if they're not heard. So I thank you, Ramola, Sherzeev, Paul, Dr. Um, Marco, um, and many, many other people I can't name, but thank you for providing the venue from which we can speak. Um, uh, my feeling is we get out of this this year, I really think so, and we get out together. And that's what it's that's, all about. Yes, that is what it's all about. And that's what our global um, email campaign is about, trying to notify public officials around the world. Um, yeah, it's very important to create forums. And I do thank Paul as well for this forum. And um, I'm very excited as well that Millicent is working with us and that she's here today. And because she, her story is going to blow everybody away because Millicent's yeah. story will offer insight into so much of this program so many different aspects of it. And Millicent is an extraordinary person because not only is she someone who has experienced this and is a survivor, is a very strong survivor and, and a brave voice, she's also an incredible researcher. And she's pointed us in the direction of so much information and we are eternally grateful to her for that because she's making this whole thing come apart, you know, come alive. And she's bringing it in to the light of day. So. Thank okay, you. Melissa, would you like to say, Melissa, would you like to say something before we sign off? I've got a final thing to say, but Melissa? Well, I, I do want to apologize for coming in at such a late time. However, I had a conflicting appointment and I thought I could get in sooner, but it just didn't work out that way. But it, it's just a pleasure to be working with Ramola. It's, it's an honor to work with someone of Karen's caliber and her willingness to actually blow the whistle on what else is happening behind the scenes. Uh, she'll, she's able to bring so much more light to, to what we can't see, information that we would never know except that she would be able to, to point us to it. So I'm just glad to be a part of this team of investigators. We're honored. We're all yeah. honored. We are honored to have you here. Uh, I'd also like to say that uh, starting, I don't know, this week or next, uh, Ramola D is going to be interviewing uh, whistleblowers, uh, not just whistleblowers, but targeted individuals. Uh, and we're going to be bringing them to the forefront and hopefully we'll be posting them not only on Ramola's YouTube channel, but also Pinecone Utopia. So listen to them, spread them far and wide. This is how we stop this atrocity from, from, from continuing. So thank you very much, team. Uh, it's, it's always wonderful and inspiring to be with you. Uh, We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.